Now, it might be hard to believe that I wasn't always so socially suave and understanding. I was a little bit of a geek, nerd, and, and uh, thank you. <laughs> I didn't have a lot of friends in school. And I didn't know what I know now that having a couple good friends is far more valuable than having 50 mediocre friends. And kids, I hope you learn that sooner than I did. That having one or two good friends goes a lot farther than having 50 mediocre friends. Having people who have your back is so important. But, man, I tried hard. I chased after people. And at some point I finally realized that I was chasing and chasing and chasing after people. And so I made myself a deal that I would try a certain number of times, and at some point I would just stop chasing and see if this was a two-way relationship or not. It hurt when people didn't pursue you, never phoned you, never stopped to say hi. But you knew where you were at in that relationship then. And it's not that it was bad. It was a friendship for a season, and I'm thankful for that. But that friendship faded away. That relationship died off. There was no valuing it. And today's Pentecost Sunday, the day when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And that, too, is a relationship. Except it's not us pursuing God, it's God pursuing us. And a question I think we need to wrestle with is, are we responding to God as he pursues us? Are we hearing God? Are we letting God's Spirit work in us and through us? And we're going to think about that today, I hope, while we talk about Pentecost. Now, I'm going to get to the scripture reading in a little bit. It's kind of interwoven in the message. I hope that's okay. Um, we have two readings today. Um, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and Galatians 4, 1 to 7. And um, really, they, they're kind of two parts that fit really well together. One's almost an introduction, and the other one is like the next step. And so we'll get to that. Now, I grew up thinking Pentecost was a new thing. That when the Holy Spirit came, that was the first Pentecost. Did anybody else have that understanding? Because Pentecost is an Old Testament celebration. I didn't know that until oh, probably about 10, 15 years ago. It's not a new idea. But what we have in Acts, which we'll get to, is Pentecost being redefined. You see, Pentecost is from one of the Old Testament festivals or feasts, the festival of new grain, where you're thanking God for the first harvest of wheat, the first fruits of the grain harvest. That's where Pentecost comes out of. And if that's about the first fruits of the grain harvest, when we think about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the question we need to be asking are, what are the first fruits of our faith that we celebrate today? What are the continued fruits that come out of our life as the Holy Spirit works in us and through us? Now, the Festival of New Grain is celebrated seven weeks after pa Passover. And that's also called the Feast of Weeks. And uh, now... Pentecost is a week of weeks, is what some people call it. Seven weeks. Which, Pentecost means 50. Anybody see the problem with that? 49? <laughs> Pentecost is the first full day of the fe Feast of Weeks, which is day 50. The Feast of Weeks starts on the 49th day, and Pentecost is considered is a 50th day, and it's the first full day of that celebration, when the Jews would thank God for the grain harvest and his provision. But it wasn't just that. 
The Feast of Weeks became, for the Jewish people, also connected to the giving of the covenant and the gift of the law. In Exodus 20s, we read the Ten Commandments. I just want to refresh some of this for us. I'm not going to go through the Ten Commandments, but I want to read the verse in Exodus 20, verse 18, and uh, just uh, refresh us what happened. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. Does that sound like a good response to you? It kind of does to me. <laughs> thunder and lightning and trumpets going off and the smoke all around the mountain. I think fear is a good response, especially if I'm not inside a building. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. They were so scared. And just some things I want us to remember as we go forward. Notice the thunder and lightning, and notice the fear that is there. Look at how they want God to speak, but not directly. Now we're going to get today's scripture passage. And uh, this is Luke writing in the book of Acts. Luke wrote the book of Luke, which makes sense. And Acts is, of course, the sequel. And he wants to give accurate and orderly accounts of what happens. He's not somebody to go and ad-lib and add creative details. He tells it like it is. That's what he wants to do. So we come to Acts 2, and this is what Luke writes. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Isn't that amazing? What would you do if that happened here right now? Would we tremble in fear? Or would we come in celebration? Would we be like the Israelites at Mount Sinai after the giving of the Ten Commandments, trembling in fear because of thunder and lightning? Or would we be standing there in awe and celebration at the sound of a wind, strong wind, a violent wind, and tongues of fire-like stuff coming down on the people. Now, in the Greek, I normally not somebody who goes into Greek a lot, but sometimes it's helpful. You see, there's a word in Greek called pneuma, which means spirit and wind. And so sometimes people hear a violent wind. Oh, that must be the Holy Spirit. No. The word there for violent wind it's just the word wind. It's no. Not N-O, but P-N-O-E. Okay? It's a different word for that violent wind. It's not the spirit. It's literally just wind. So the violent wind sound isn't the Holy Spirit. I think that's important for us as we learn about the Holy Spirit. That is not a violent thing. It's important we understand that. And then the second phenomenon that happens is tongues of fire. Now, it actually says what seemed to be tongues of fire. We don't actually know what it was. And apparently Luke didn't know either, because it appeared to be what was like tongues of fire. All we know is it was miraculous and amazing. I mean, imagine us sitting here and having like little mini northern lights flashing over our heads. Wouldn't that be pretty remarkable? Or flames over our heads. We can't even begin to imagine it. But this isn't a fictional story. This is real. This is what happened. And it's exciting. This is the start of the church, of the Spirit coming into our midst. Now, in Greco-Roman writings, Greek-Roman writings, and even some of the contemporary Jewish writings, Fire was used as a metaphor for prophetic inspiration. The point here is it's no metaphor. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's come upon God's people. 
it's not a metaphor for inspiration. It is, no, no, there actually is inspiration. God has come into our midst that way. And here on Pentecost, a day that remembers the giving of the law in Sinai, a day when there's lightning and thunder, and people were trembling in fear, we come to this rushing wind and this fire, this light over people's heads. And wind and fire aren't unusual symbols of God's presence. But you notice what's different here? We don't hear any comments about fear or trembling. The Holy Spirit's come. And people aren't fearful. They're not scared. Wouldn't you be afraid? I don't know. I'd love to have been there to experience that. Wouldn't you? Maybe we're all too good Baptists to say yes. Because us Baptists don't always talk about the Holy Spirit as much. Why weren't they afraid? Well, the only answer I can think of is that they sense God at work. And the Holy Spirit's at the center of what's happening. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, not just some, not just the leaders or the important people, or the, the longer, the older believers, the more mature believers. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they all began to speak in other languages. But there's an important part added on to that. As the Spirit enabled them. It wasn't their doing. It wasn't their knowledge. The Holy Spirit was in them. And equipped them and started speaking in all other languages. Now, Pentecost for the Jews was a pilgrimage festival. So the men would go to Jerusalem for this celebration. So here they are at Pentecost when the city is bursting at the seams. Right? And on this Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes and gives this very visual, miraculous happening of people speaking in all sorts of languages. Think about the impact for evangelism that would have. Think about the witness of that of this miraculous thing. There's an expectation that in the days of the Messiah that the spirit of prophecy would come. That's the Holy Spirit. Jesus has ascended but not abandoned his followers and sent his spirit to them. And Acts 2 is probably the most talked about part of Acts. The most talked about episode in Acts. And you know what, it's only four verses. And it's so talked about. And it's caused division in the church as people wrestle with it. It's caused whole denominations to come up. In fact, some people argue and say, well, that was then, this is now, those giftings were then, they don't happen anymore. They, and that. But we're not told that. That's our way of making us comfortable with ourselves. We're not told that those gifts stopped. In fact, I know a number of people who have the gift of tongues and they're Baptist. Can you believe that? The nerve of them! But the gift of tongues for them is their prayer language. And they've come to me and said, as a pastor before, like, Mike, I, I don't know what to do with this. I actually have this gift of tongues, I think, and that's how I pray. By myself. I said, what's wrong with that? He goes, well, I'm Baptist. Is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. God's gifted you with this prayer language for you to pray. Now, Paul talks later on about the gift of tongues, and there's some challenges with that. Um, people in the church speaking in tongues and nobody able to understand, and so Paul says there needs to be interpretation, but that's not what I'm talking about here. But we can get caught up in those little details and miss the miracle. This was miraculous. This was incredible. But it's only four verses. Why only four verses? And here's my theory. We're not called to dwell on the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
We're called to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit, to know about the coming of the Holy Spirit, but that's not what we dwell on. We're called to recognize God at work, yes, but even more, we're called to celebrate what the Holy Spirit is doing and does day to day. That the Holy Spirit was not a one-time event back then, but a coming for all believers for all time. That Pentecost was a gift that was given for us. We're supposed to dwell on the working of the Spirit in God's people, not just on the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we see in the book of Acts the powerful effect of the Spirit on the church's mission to Israel and ultimately to the world. And what we have is on Sinai, God revealed himself with the law as well. But on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is revealed to us. On Sinai, God was distant and feared. On Pentecost, God was close and intimate and miraculous and loved. In Acts 1 7, Jesus says, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Pentecost was a date set by God. And the other thing we need to recognize from Acts is that the Holy Spirit was poured out on a community of believers, not a personal gift for one person that's private. It was a communal gift given to everybody. And the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life isn't just for me or just for you. It's for all of us. We're each gifted by the Holy Spirit and we need to use those gifts, both in the church and in the world outside the church, to share the good news of Jesus. Now, as Baptists, sometimes we just kind of think, well, you have your spirit and I have mine. <laughs> we don't want to talk about it. The Holy Spirit's often kept hidden and private in our faith. Look at our songs that we sing. Look at the hymns. How many of them mention the Holy Spirit? Or are just about the Holy Spirit? Not as many as about Jesus and, and God the Father, in my experience. Depends on the tradition you come from. But I think we need to be reminded that we're sinning if we see the Holy Spirit as a lesser part of the triune God that's called by Terrianism. And we're Trinitarian. We believe that God is three in one, not two in one. If we just worship the Father and the Son and see the Holy Spirit as a marginal side member of the Trinity, that's actually a heresy. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three in one. All fully God and one God that we worship. So we can't ignore the Holy Spirit. We shouldn't ignore the Holy Spirit. And if we are ignoring the Holy Spirit, we're actually practicing a heresy that's gone back a long ways. And we're also denying God's work in our lives. I'm going to hop to Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. I'm going to read it and just add some thoughts as we go through it. And it begins off by saying, what I am saying is that as long as an heir, as an heir, is underage, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. And what it's talking about is somebody who's owed an inheritance. He's an heir to the inheritance. And if you're underage, you can't claim the inheritance until you're of age. You're just like a slave. There's nothing there for you yet. You might own the whole property, but the reality is, you can't do anything with it yet. The minor will be a heir, an heir, but isn't really yet. And comparing it to a slave is making an argument that living under the law makes us like a slave. We're in bondage and not free. We might have an inheritance, but if we're living underneath the law, we're just like a slave. We're not free. We're burdened. The passage continues, 
The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. We're not under our own authority when we're under the law. We're controlled by others while awaiting that inheritance. Before coming to Christ, we were enslaved by the spiritual forces and powers of this world. By the elements of this world. By the spiritual elements of this world. We were in bondage to them. And we don't have to look far around us to see that. To see the bondage of alcohol and drugs. To see the bondage of money. The bondage of pride and arrogance. We could go on and on and on with things that bind us and we allow to bind us. But I think if we are each to reflect our own life, we'll find something there that has bound us at some point in our life. And this period of infancy and immaturity is talking about where the era is, is referring to an era of uh, salvation history when the Mosaic Law was in force. That's when we were like minors and we were like slaves. And the passage continues, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. The reign of the law ceases with the coming of Christ. Now, he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, we're told. And Jesus accomplished what no one else could. He lived sinless under the law. He's the true offspring of Abraham, the true Israel, the true Son of God. And as a result, Jesus took the curse of the law on himself to free those who are captivated or held captive by the power of sin. Paul continues writing, Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you're his child, God has made you also an heir. And this use of heir is important. The book itself is an argument, argument about who will receive the inheritance promised to Abraham. And there's a new era that's arrived in salvation history with the arrival of God's Son. He was truly human, born of a woman, and he lived under the law. But deliverance for us from the law comes only through the cross of Christ, and those who are redeemed, we're told, are God's children. We're redeemed in Jesus so we could be adopted by God. We're adopted, we become heirs. Not under agers, but heirs who inherit a relationship with God. Jesus was true and perfect Son of God and took on himself the curse of sin. And our redemption came at the cost of Jesus' life. We know this. And those freed and redeemed from slavery who accept Jesus' grace are adopted as God's children. And when it's talking about people being adopted as God's children, he uses the word we. That's both Jews and Gentiles. In other words, everybody, anyone who follows Jesus is adopted as God's child. And what's the proof we're, we're adopted as God's children? The proof is that God has given us the Holy Spirit. So if we're a follower of Jesus, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit marks us as members of the people of God. God sent his Son and now has sent his Spirit. And that Spirit confirms, authenticates, and ratifies our being children of God. We're no longer minors or slaves we no longer live under the old age of redemptive history, slaves under sin. We're redeemed are our children and heirs of, heirs of God. God planned the whole history in his own wisdom, determined when the Son and the Spirit would be sent in the world. 
And if God rules over history that way, we can trust God. And we don't need to tremble in fear like the people at Mount Sinai did at the thought of the Holy Spirit. We can pray to God. God, reveal your spirit in me. Show me the gifts that God has given, that your spirit is giving me. May I hear your spirit speaking to me and leading me. Help me pay attention to that, God. In some ways, what Paul is saying is that we're enslaved to the basic principles of religion, whether pagan or Jewish law. And with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we've outgrown or transcended that to have a relationship with the one true God. We only enter God's family by adoption by Jesus. But the Spirit comes to us. And the Holy Spirit is not like a second baptism or a second blessing. Something that you have to strive for, do something for to get. That's works-based. We're saved by grace. By the grace of Jesus Christ, we're saved. And by the grace of Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. The sending of the Holy Spirit is God's actions. And it confirms our entrance into God's family. It frees us through the work of Christ. We're not in bondage anymore. We don't have to be. And that's the challenge for us today. Is are we allowing ourselves to be held in bondage by something? What may be holding you in bondage? Think about it. Have you given your life over to God fully? Or are you holding on to something? Are you holding on to some sin in your life? This world has no lack of sin for us to hold on to. No lack of ways for us to get off track and try and do things by our own strength and to ignore what God is trying to do in our life. But I want you to know that in Jesus Christ, we have freedom. We can turn to Christ and have His grace and know that His Spirit is in us, working in us, calling us to God working to transform us and change us and disciple us as followers of Jesus. What an incredible gift that is. And the question is, what are you going to do with that gift? With that relationship that's there waiting, are you going to ignore it? Or are you going to allow God's Spirit to work in you? To prompt you? to challenge you, to call you to faithfulness. And will you live the life that God wants you to live in the fullness of God's grace as the Holy Spirit works through you? Let's bow in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you that you're the triune God three in one. Lord, help us to slow down in life and stop trying to do it all ourselves, but to trust you and to listen to you, to listen to your spirit in us, working in us, calling us to obedience, prompting us in ministry. And may we be obedient. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let us go now. With the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit working in us and through us in the world. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.